Okay, let's start. Um, welcome to the DDPS seminar uh, today. Before we introduce today's speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. First of all, please mute yourself during the talk unless it is urgent so that our speaker can talk without unnecessary interruptions. That way we all can enjoy and focus on the talk. Second, uh, no classified discussion is allowed here, so watch out. Finally, uh, the talk today will be recorded, so if you have questions, it is encouraged to use the chat room so that our speaker can address them at the end of the seminar. But if you like to address the question right away, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. That's no problem. Okay, that's about it. Now let's introduce our speaker today. Um, I'm honored to host today's speaker, Professor Stephen Brunton from uh, University of Washington. Strictly speaking, I do not have to introduce him because he is just famous. You probably all know him as a great scientist and popular YouTuber. If you are not aware of his YouTube channel, try to search his name in YouTube. You will see a series of lectures, very informal, on various computational science subjects such as fluid, fluid mechanics, machine learning, and many more. He has achieved a great deal uh, in his career. Uh, just to mention a few, he received the Army and Air Force Young Investigator Program Awards and the Presidential Early Career Awards for Scientists and Engineers. Today, he is going to talk about interpretable and generalizable machine learning for fluid mechanics. We expect a great talk from Steve today. Now, let me pass the baton to Steve. Steve, it's all yours. So thank you very much for the very kind introduction and also for the invitation. Um, and thank you all for being here. So it's really a pleasure to get to tell you uh, just a little kind of window into what's happening in my lab and in the labs of some of my close collaborators working on this very interesting problem of machine learning for fluid dynamics. Uh, and before I jump in, I want to acknowledge uh, some of my closest colleagues and co-authors on the work I'm going to show today. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about has been work done with uh, Nathan Kutz and John Christoph Lazo, and many of our excellent uh, PhD students and postdocs uh, imaged below here. And I'll point out this is really just uh, kind of zoom in to one topic in my lab. And so again, kind of in the picture, uh, you know, feel free to interrupt and ask any questions you want or um, you know a lot I'm going to talk that I'm not going to talk about is on YouTube uh, or in our papers. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is going to parallel a review paper that we recently wrote uh, myself with Barrett Nowak and Petros Kubitakis and this was an annual review of fluid mechanics in uh, machine learning for fluid mechanics. And so the big idea here is that machine learning is not going to replace modeling, simulations, experiments. It's going to complement our historical efforts in these thrusts. And so um, just like the computational fluid dynamics did not put experiments out of business, but instead created this complementary view of the world, we believe that that's how machine learning is also going to enter uh, in this next phase of data intensive studies. And so, um, you know, I, I like giving this talk to an audience here, like a, a technical audience of scientists and engineers, but I often find myself giving this talk to um, senior leaders at companies like Boeing or Lockheed. And often when I talk about machine learning, I get this feeling that maybe they think of machine learning as a magic wand. They've got some big engineering problem that's costing them billions of dollars, and they're going to point magic, the magic wand at it, and poof, it's going to get better. And that's not how machine learning works. So at the very offset, I want to uh, give you an idea of how I think of machine learning as it relates to engineering problems. So I want to massively oversimplify and say that machine learning is a growing set of techniques to build models from data, either through optimization or regression, okay? So it's a better way of modeling from an increasingly rich set of data 
through advanced optimization and regression algorithms developed over the past decades in statistics and applied math. And so in blue here, I'm pointing out, hopefully, many of our clinical challenges in mechanics, model reduction, sparse sensing, optimal sensor placement, uh, optimal control. These can naturally be posed as optimization problems. And those optimization problems have the challenges outlined in pink. They are nonlinear because the Navier Stokes equations are not linear. They're high dimensional because our fluids are often multi scale in space and time. So we need lots of discretization points. And that culminates into a very large non convex optimization problem. Lots of local minima to solve these optimal control and sensing and modeling problems in fluids. And that's why they've been traditionally so challenging. Machine learning is a growing set of techniques that is tailored specifically for these kinds of high non-convex optimization problems that occur in image classification and video processing. And so there's a lot that we can carry with us over to our engineering problems in fluid mechanics. Now, this is a just a snapshot of how I see the world. I want to give you a big picture of what my lab does. Uh, my wife likes to joke that I'm a bit of a control freak. So I try to put everything in the world up here in the dynamics block. And then I spend my time uh, in my lab trying to uh, focus on how to design controllers to manipulate the behavior of my system to some uh, engineering nominal configuration. And so a lot of what my lab works on is applying machine learning to build dynamical system models of these complex systems. And we want them to be interpretable and generalizable. We want to uncover the underlying physics of the systems as much as possible. Good. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a lot more about this block in a little bit. The next area we focus a lot on is in trying to learn controllers through trial and error, through kind of biologically inspired uh, optimization algorithms, and a lot of our work is in renewable energy systems, aerospace fluid systems. And then the third big area of work that we think about a lot in my lab is in sparse sensor uh, placement and optimization. So if you had a set of sensors, a few sensors or actuators, where would you put them to maximally impact your system? And this is very much inspired by biological uh, systems like that have on their wings distributed tens, if not strain-sensitive neurons that they use to inform their control algorithms. Now, I want to point out at the offset that although I'm going to be talking about fluid dynamic systems, most of what I'm talking about will apply to generic high-dimensional multi-scale systems. So you can think about a disease spreading across a continent, or your network of neurons in your brain, or a financial market. These are kind of high-dimensional, time-varying, nonlinear processes that we can uncover models and controllers and get good sensor and actuator placement, which I'm going to discuss today. Good. Now, I'm going to start off my uh, kind of vignettes into machine learning for fluids with what I'm going to call kind of the lowest hanging fruit. And the lowest hanging fruit in uh, machine learning for fluids is when you can treat your data like it's an image or a series of images that are evolving in time. Because there have been literally billions of dollars of industry investment over the last few decades on developing uh, very powerful image processing techniques in robust statistics and machine learning. Um, so the, the minute we can cast our problem as an image science problem, we get tremendous amounts uh, of algorithms for free. And so I love this picture. This is taken from a review paper by Sam Tyra from UCLA, where uh, he's pointing out kind of this emergence of low-dimensional coherent structures or patterns in this very complex flow over Rishiri Island, flow past the mountain, past the volcano. Uh, and you can see that even though it's a very complex geophysical flow, it has this emergent street that we see in much simpler low Reynolds number flow path facilities. And the idea that there are these low dimensional patterns that emerge in these fluid dynamic applications is one of the cornerstones of modern fluid, but it's also a cornerstone of machine learning. All of what we talk about in machine learning is based on the fact that there are patterns that you can exploit for some objective. 
If it were aggregate, we'd be stuck. There would be no effort or no, no point in putting in the effort to machine learning or to data-driven fluid. So the first thing I want to show you is this one by Isabel Sherl, who's a PhD student working with Brian Palagi at the end of And what she has done here is try to take these real image processing techniques from image sciences and apply experimental fluid mechanics. So here in the movie, the flow pass the cylinder, can make it much more like what you would be experiments from a particle image velocimetry laser sheet experiment. And any of you who have done these experiments know that you don't get perfectly clean flow fields. You often have this kind of TV static that's on top of, of the flow field. And we've made it extra bad here as a cartoon. Uh, but the goal in this case is to leverage the fact that there are patterns to clean the data and extract those patterns and clean up the, the noise. And so what we're trying to do is take this movie uh, given by X and decompose it into the sum of two movies, L plus S, where L has all of the coherent structures and statistically correlated patterns, and S is everything that's uncorrelated with that low dimensional structure. And this movie cartoon, this is really an algorithm that she wrote for this data in X, and this is the decomposition she gets, which is an incredible clean version of L, the actual flow past the cylinder, where it separates out all of the contaminants all the right tests. So again, to do this, it really relies on writing down the right optimization problem. In this case, this seems too good to be true. There's in many ways of decomposing one matrix into the sum of two. And so we find the right decomposition, the decomposition we want, by imposing our physical priors into the optimization problem. In this case, we want L to be low rank, and we want S to be sparse. And this is the famous robust principle components analysis algorithm of Candens et al. that we had uh, extended and used for fluid systems. Now, the op optimization I have in blue is non-convex and intractable at scale. This does not scale with Moore's law. So we have to relax this to something that does scale. And so the convex relaxation, we swap out the rank of L for the nuclear norm, and we swap out the zero norm of S for the one norm. And those with high probability will still promote these low rank sparse decompositions. Now, when you take the clean version in L and compute the principal components, we get the modes on the right column that are almost perfect in almost perfect agreement with the true modes of the clean system in the left. And if we we naively apply this dimensionality to the noisy data in X, we would get these contaminated modes in the middle. Now, when you build models based on these models, sorry, based on these modes, um, so DMD before that, you get a bunch of eigenvalues inside the unit circle. We expect all the eigenvalues to live on the unit circle because it's a purely periodic system, but many of them are contaminated with that noise. However, after applying the robust clean procedure and we apply DMD to the L matrix, almost all of our eigenvalues are perfectly on the unit circle. So this is really good confirmation that this is working, not just for getting modes, but for getting models. And if you're interested in this, I'll point you to Isabel's paper in Physical Review uh, Fluids, where she applies this to the Johns Hopkins Turbulence Database, the uh, turbulent channel flow. See what the filtering effects are on high wave number turbulence when we apply this decomposition. So really interesting uh, results. She also applies this to two experimental PIV data sets. Good. Long story short, if you can view your flow field as an image sheet, you immediately get techniques for free. So another example that's really promising is super resolution. So this is very, very closely related to many problems in fluid mechanics where either you have limited measurements of a system or where you want to simulate a high resolution system with low resolution grid, like in a large eddy simulation. And so this is work by Ben Erickson when he was a postdoc with Nathan and me, where he essentially built a shallow decoder network so that you can take this low resolution down sample image in panel B, and you can reconstruct from training data the high resolution uh, flow field that you use to train. So this is a super resolution task, and this is again Hopkins turbulence data set. So this works 
surprisingly well with relatively small data set when you set it up as an interpolation task. And I really want to highlight that in machine learning, uh, the neural network approaches that a lot of people are using and that we're using here are extremely powerful for interpolation, but they're not that great for extrapolation. So if you look at the lower left here, what you'll see is how we have arranged our training and our test data. So the training data is given by these dark columns in gray, and the test data are these light blue columns. So what you'll notice is that nearly every test data set is sandwiched between two training sets. And so in some sense, everything is interpolated in the future. But when you set up the problem to look more like an extrapolation task, so I train on the first 70% of my data, and then I test on the next 30% in time, the prediction starts off being very good. You get very good super resolution for short times, but for longer times, the super resolution degrades quite rapidly. And again, this is just pointing out the fact that uh, interpolation problems are somehow easy, and extrapolation problems can be quite difficult. Okay. Now, in image sciences, Google Images or Facebook, you often have um, kind of this idea that these tasks can really be doing extrapolation, but I would argue that Google Images and Facebook have so many images, their training data is so large, that almost every task in the future is fundamentally an interpolation of, between things you've already seen in the past, okay? And so for us to reach that level of data in fluid mechanics so that future tasks or look like interpolations is going to be extremely challenging for highly uh, turbulent flows. Even works right. So in climate science or control, we want to train on the past. We don't believe that the future is going to necessarily look like the past, either in the climate because control because we're actively trying to move our system to a different space. Okay. So this is kind of a, a caveat story wrapped into one. You can get lots of great results with interpolation, but extrapolation is hard. Okay, good. I'm going to start transitioning from this idea that if you look at your data like images, things are easy, and I'm going to start going into this world of modeling dynamical systems and bringing in more physics into the picture. Okay, so that's where it's really getting interesting, uh, at least for my group. So I want to talk about this really exciting work by Jared Callahan, a PhD student working with me uh, and Nathan Kutz, where he's essentially trying to learn from data these dominant balance physics laws that uh, essentially codify asymptotic uh, balance laws in governing physics. Okay, so we're going to look at the Johns Hopkins uh, turbulent, uh, turbulent boundary layer data, and I'm going to walk you through how Jared's automated method works. The Reynolds average Navier Stokes equations for that turbulent um, that turbulent flow field. And you can see that there are six equations, six terms in the equations. So for each term, I can plot that term spatially over the entire spatial field. So this is the U bar, U bar X field. Not all six of your equation terms like that. So sometimes they're large, sometimes they're small, and they it's in different ways in different regions of the space. And so what Jared realized is that you can take this data and you can plot it instead of spatially equation terms. You can take each space and you can plot it in a six-dimensional equation space. So every point can be scatter plotted in the six-dimensional equation space. I'm showing you a couple of slices here in the upper right. And you can see that the data has patterns. There are different patterns that the data adheres to in equation space. So if we apply clustering, really simple stuff, Gaussian mixture models in this case, you can find that there are these different unique clusters of these spatial points in how the equation term works. And for example, you see in red, our U bar X term is always zero, even though you get red in the other equation terms. And so if we try to find sparse spaces in equation space where the clusters live, what you find is that there are these uh, five color-coded regions 
where you have different dominant balance physics, where different terms are and balance each other in the physics, all the other terms are nearly equal to zero. So this is a really a data-driven automatic uh, generalization of the asymptotics from the 50s and the 60s, where a lot of applied math departments in the built around asymptotics dominant balance for fluids. So in these regions back in space, you find that you recover many of the canonical the boundary layer that we know about that were hard fought through a real analysis. And so, for example, this all came directly out of that data just by plotting it in equation space. We learned from the data that there's a viscous sublayer and a transitional region and an inertial sublayer. And those have the right balanced physics uh, of which terms are active in those equations. So in principle, you could use this for reduced order modeling, potentially for different closure modeling in these different regions. I think this guy's the limit. Very exciting. And what's really nice about this is that you can apply this to systems where we have not had thousands of brilliant researchers over 100 years studying the system. So we can apply this to uh, optical pulse propagation. This is the super continuum high energy laser where we can find dominant physics regimes. You can apply this to the Gulf of Mexico and recover uh, geostrophic balances and other balances and maybe discover new balances that were slightly more complicated than what people could write down with their kind of human intuition. Uh, we've applied this to neuroscience systems, rotating detonation engines. I really encourage you to try to think about the equation space because it is talking how, how much your answer is in this equation space. Okay, wonderful. So that was just one kind of approach, still based on image, looking at things like images, but now we're starting to build in these dynamical systems elements of the actual terms of the physics. Good. So for the remainder of the talk, for the next half, I'm going to talk almost about reduced order modeling for I uh, idea of interpretable and generalizable machine learning. Good. So I have been preaching this for a while, and I know uh, my good colleague and friend Nathan Kutz uh, is also uh, preaching the same story, that we don't just want black box machine learning techniques. Those are powerful. They're useful. You know, the representational power of neural can not be discarded or uh, underestimated. But we don't want all of our advances in machine learning to be okay. We want interpretable, generalizable models too. And instead of defining interpretable and general, because I'm sure that I, I will make most of you disagree by trying to define them, I'm going to describe what I mean through an analogy. So I think that Newton's second law, FA, is the quintessential interpretable, generalizable model. So let's break it down. It's interpretable in that there are terms, S, M, they have units, they balance each other out. We can write these down for a system and we can discuss what it means. We can do analysis, they're interpretable. It's generalizable in the sense that Newton can learn F equals N A, any equal on Earth, or so the story goes. And that law is still valid when we design space missions to send humans to the moon. So, ultimate generalizable model. Now, build a some videos of apples falling on Earth. They would, with enough data, faithfully reproduce the trajectories of apples and be able to even make movies of apples falling. But it would be useful for designing things to the moon. It would not generalize beyond falling apples. And this idea is not just a special second law. It's special to E equal squared. And in fact, the entire history of mathematics for the years has been formulated assumption that things should be as simple as possible and no simpler. So this is the principle of parsimony. This is uh, Aristotle's principle. This was Ptolemy's principle, Pareto, um, Occam, Einstein, Newton, you name it. The great advances occurred because of parsimonious models. And so what that means mathematically today, in my opinion, is sparsity and low dimensionality. I want low dimensional models. I want to get rid of all of the clutter and focus on the variables that matter. What are the variables that matter for the following example? Well, it's F, M, and A. Now, sparsity comes in because the description, the physical law 
uh, that describes how those low dimensional, dimensional quantities interact, I want it as possible too. I want it to have as few terms as possible. And generally, by hey, hey, Steve, hey, hey, Steve. Yes. I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, I don't know why, but um, the sound is breaking sometimes. So may maybe you can um, uh, not showing your face, <laughs> the video, the turn of uh, the video, and just. Can you hear me? Can you hear me better now? Uh, yeah. 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 Wait, Let, let's try that. Is yeah. Let's try that. Yeah. Let's try that. Good. So, so the real idea here is that by imposing sparsity and low dimensionality, we tend to promote models that are robust, interpretable, and generalizable. And so that's what I'm going to talk about um, for the second half of the talk. Now, Newton's second law is great, but for complex systems like fluid flows, uh, I think an even better analogy is this thermal convection model of Lorentz, the Lorentz 63 model. So the idea here is that even for a very complicated high dimensional fluid flow like Rayleigh Bernard convection, if we pull out the right coordinate system, you can get a very, very simple model for this fluid flow given by these Lorentz equations uh, here in X, Y, and Z. And again, this has all of the three characteristics, the, the two characteristics we're looking for. It's low dimensional in terms of three variables, X, Y, and Z. And the right-hand side dynamics are sparse. Only a few terms are active in the dynamics out of all of the things that you could possibly write down to describe this equation. Um, and so this is the kind of idea we want to bring into fluids. We want to automate Lorentz for fluid systems. And the way that we do that is through this algorithm called the Sparse Identification of Nonlinear Dynamics, or SINDI for an acronym. And I'm going to walk you through this on the Lorentz system. So we're going to imagine that we have the system on the left, but we don't know the equations. All that we do is measure x, y, and z, and we compute the derivatives x dot y dot and z dot from those measurements. So each row is a measurement in time. And the simplest thing you might be able to do is a linear best fit regression. That's what the dynamic mode decomposition does, is a linear best fit regression to find the best 3 by 3 A matrix that would map x, y, and z to x dot y dot z dot. But I don't think any of us really believe that a 3 by 3 linear model could possibly capture the richness and complexity of the Lorentz system. The A matrix has one fixed point at the origin, whereas Lorentz has multiple fixed points, an unstable periodic orbit, and uh, chaos. And so instead of this linear regression, what we do is we augment our right-hand side library to include more possible terms in the library in the dynamics. And now the goal is to find the fewest columns of theta that equal x dot, that equal y dot, and that equal z dot. In this case, my theta matrix includes polynomials up to fifth order polynomials. And those can all be constructed from my measurements of x, y, and z. Now, if you asked me 20 years ago, I would have said that this is actually uh, an intractable brute force problem. You wouldn't be able to solve this sparse optimization. But in the last 20 years, this has essentially become a commodity. There are dozens of algorithms for finding the sparsest linear combination of columns of theta that equal x dot. And in doing so, what we find is that the sparsest combination of uh, terms that equal x dot are actually the terms in the original Lorentz system and the same for y dot and z dot. And so by collecting the data like this and applying sparse optimization, we essentially uncover the nonlinear structure and the parameters of our, of our uh, Lorentz system that generated that data. And remember, in this example, I never saw the equations. I only collected measurement data. So this is true nonlinear system identification. You can actually uncover real physics from measurement data. Now, if you're interested in this, uh, we recently released an open source software package, PySynDy, so you can download this and try it out yourself uh, on your data sets. Good. So now you can also, instead of just discovering ordinary differential equations, we can discover partial differential equations. Let's say I take my flow path to cylinder example, where I measure omega, uh, the vorticity, and the x and y components of velocity, u and v. Now I can build a similar library, like in Cindy, but I can include partial derivatives of these variables, a nonlinear product of those partial derivatives. 
And when I find the sparsest combination that equals the time derivative of vorticity, lo and behold, we find, we uncover the, non, the Navier-Stokes equations. And we get the Reynolds number to within about 1%, which is quite remarkable. Since our data is so vast in space and time, you can dramatically downsample your data. And when you run this library uh, regression, on, even on this subsample data, we still recover the correct equations. So pretty cool. We've applied this to you know, a dozen other PDEs. And in every case where we knew the answer ahead of time, our method came up with the true physics of the system. And we're currently using this with our collaborators uh, in plasma physics to try to find a hierarchy of models that goes beyond the MHD equations that are both more complex and less complex at different fidelities. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about how we use these to get reduced order models for fluids. So back to our flow path to cylinder. Uh, in 2003, Barrett Nowak and collaborators in this famous paper showed us that if we measure the system in the right coordinate frame, in these three coordinates given by POD1, POD2, and the shift mode, that our system actually becomes quite simple. We can go lurk and project the Navier-Stokes equations onto these three modes, and we get a system of ordinary differential equations in blue here that is characterized by a slow manifold, a parabolic slow manifold, that captures all of the transient and steady state behavior of the system. So we thought this would be a good test case for Cindy. We collect measurements of the simulation in those coordinates, and we run it through our sparse library procedure. And what we find is a governing equation system that is very similar to that in blue. We have the same slow quadratic manifold, the same transients, and so this was very promising. We can discover the reduced order model that experts, you know, took years to write down, no act at all, directly from the measurement data if we measure it in the right coordinates x, y, and z. Now, shortly after we published this paper, I got an email from John Christophe Loiseau from Paris Tech, and he came up with two very, very cool innovations that I think have made this much more powerful for physical systems. So the first innovation is that we know a tremendous amount about the structure of the Navier-Stokes equations and how those conservation of energy manifest itself in these reduced order equations. Specifically, we know that these models have skew symmetric quadratic nonlinearities. And so our sparsity procedure is essentially based on an iterative least squares procedure where you do a least square solution, you zero out small terms of the coefficients, you do another least squares onto the remaining coefficients, you zero out the small ones, and so on and so forth. And at each stage, we can include constraint equations that enforce the skew symmetric, symmetric uh, energy conservation. And so what JC did was just by adding these constraint equations, we can force our Cindy models to be conservative by construction, which immediately improves stability of the models. The second innovation that I think is really neat is our original model, we tried to include quadratic nonlinearity because that's what the Navier-Stokes equations have. But if you allow yourself higher order nonlinearity, cubic, quintic, septic, nonic terms, you can account for the very low energy modes that we've truncated on how they affect the, the high energy modes, X and Y. And so just as a cartoon here, what you see in this Z equation, if lambda is a very fast eigenvalue, then Z rapidly equilibrates to X squared plus Y squared. That's what this slow parabolic manifold means. And if you substitute Z equals X squared plus Y squared into the first two equations, you get a term that looks cubic. Uh, that third term looks cubic. And similarly, if I substitute in the next higher frequency mode pair, I'll get fifth order terms. And the next higher mode pair are seventh order, and so on and so forth. And by including these higher order nonlinearities, we in some sense get a rudimentary closure model for the low energy modes we've truncated. Good. Now let's see how well this works on some real examples. So the cavity flow in the cylinder flow here. The column on the right, what I'm showing, 
is the industry standard state-of-the-art POD Galerkin models with three modes and seven modes. So the light curve here is a proxy for the drag coefficient, and you can see how it evolves in time. Now, both of the POD models essentially uh, capture the right qualitative dynamics, but they fail quantitatively. They have the wrong rise time, they overshoot, and they have steady state error. But when we include these cubic constrained Cindy models, we almost perfectly quantitatively match all of the aspects of this transient drag coefficient. So this is much more accurate and useful for drag prediction and for control. And what's nice is that these Cindy models are sparse by construction. They only have a few terms. And so we can manipulate those terms. And this is exactly what JC did. And he was able to cook up an extremely simple model in terms uh, of the cylinder flow as a spring mass damper with nonlinear damping or a Vanderpool oscillator. And so to date, uh, to my knowledge, this is both the most accurate and the simplest model for the cylinder flow that has ever been written down. Okay, and so that's what I mean when I say that sparse low dimensional modeling gives you the power of really extracting something interpretable and generalizable. Now, you don't need the full flow field to do this. You don't need to do POD. It turns out you can build these models purely based on lift and drag measurements on the bodies themselves. So in this case of the fluidic pinball, we have three uh, cylinders in an arrangement, and all we measure is lift and drag. And you can build very, very faithful nonlinear models that capture these lift and drag dynamics. Okay, good. So, um, Let's go back to this chaotic thermal convection. So I've shown you, hopefully, that we can get reduced order models for these, uh, these wake systems and these shear systems. Um, and going back to this Lorentz model for thermal convection, I really want to share this uh, cool work by JC. This is the same JC Lazo from before. Um, this is work he published in 2020, just at the end of last year, where he's looking at this thermal, this thermosiphon, which is basically a hula hoop that is heated from below and cools from the top. And by extracting the modes using dynamic mode decomposition and modeling the time series using Cindy, he showed that this system has exactly the same dynamics as the traditional Lorentz 63 model of standard Rayleigh Bernard convection, which is very cool. So he showed in some sense that this Lorentz model is a normal form for other types of thermal convection in different geometries. I recently worked with uh, Igor Novosilov and Ife Kwan, who is his PhD student, on chaotic electroconvection, which has a more complex three-way coupling between the fluid flow, the charge density, and the electric field. Uh, and what we found is that this is an incredibly rich chaotic convection system. So if you take your time series of data and you extract your low-dimensional representation, your POD modes, what we find is that the mode amplitudes, how these mode amplitudes evolve in time, have incredible symmetries. So A1 is the amplitude of mode 1, A2 is the amplitude of mode 2, and so on and so forth. And these mode mixtures change in time, but they adhere to these very strong symmetries that you see in the data. And so we can extract what symmetries had to be true from the data and enforce those in our constraints in the architecture. And what we get out is a sparse kind of skeletal model that captures those qualitative features uh, of this kind of symmetric chaotic convection system. And I want to zoom in a little farther to these symmetries. So if we zoom in to this data, we find these five fundamental symmetries. <clears throat> and what that means is that when I build my Cindy library, all of these different nonlinear terms, many of them, more than half of them, are immediately eliminated because they can't possibly exist with those observed symmetries. And so what this does is this means that we're searching in a much smaller search space of possible nonlinear dynamics. And so we can get away with less data. We get better models with less data by enforcing these symmetries. And our resulting model essentially captures these different chaotic paths that the system can take very faithfully. It captures the statistics, and we can reconstruct the flows uh, dynamically using these models. 
So I was pretty pleased with this. I was really impressed uh, by this work by Yifei Guan, who's now a postdoc at Rice. Uh, and Alan Captain Oglu, who's a fantastic PhD student working with me, has been extending this to Spheromac fusion reactors. So he has a simulation here that's matched to an experiment. And by extracting the right POD modes, these are dimensional POD modes, he's able to build these sparse <coughs> constrained Cindy models that essentially capture the same attracting dynamics of these coarse variables much, much more efficient than actually solving these numerically. So we're hoping that we can include the effects of control and disturbances and injector dynamics and actually use these reduced order models for efficient real-time control in experiments. Good. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to tell you about uh, before I break for questions is how we are extending this to stochastic systems. So this is work by Jared Callahan that he calls Langevin regression. And the idea here is that for really turbulent systems, we're not just modeling a few coherent structures. There's also this effect of turbulence and forcing. So we're not only going to model x dot equals f of x, where x are my low dimensional coherent structures, we're also going to include this effect of colored noise forcing in sigma x that accounts for all of the turbulence. This is called the Langevin equation, and we're going to identify this using our Cindy approach. Now, this is closely related to Fokker Planck, uh, which involves distributions. And I'm not going to go through all of the details of our algorithm. Essentially, we're, we're parameterizing our nonlinear dynamics and our noise model, and we're trying to learn a sparse nonlinear model for the system. This requires building distributions and doing adjoint optimization, so it's a bit more involved. But in every example we've looked at, from toy problems to turbulent wakes, we uncover low dimensional nonlinear dynamical systems models with the correct bifurcation and with the correct colored noise forcing. And we've applied this to experiments with our collaborator George Regis at Imperial for the turbulent axisymmetric wake of a bluff body uh, with real turbulent experimental data. And it works. And so just for a movie here, uh, this is again that um, uh, a more turbulent cavity flow example. And what we find is that we don't just get the right uh, kind of quasi-periodic behavior, we also get the right broadening of that trajectory because of the noise model, because of this colored noise model. So that's also really important for uh, turbulent statistics. Okay, so uh, I've talked about a lot, and I think it's probably best at this point for me to stop and uh, field any questions. And I have tons of additional stuff I'd love to talk about, so feel free to ask me anything. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, for the great talk, uh, as usual. Um, let's, yeah, let's open uh, to the audience for the, any, any questions. Uh, please speak out if you have any questions. Okay, I have one. Um, so a lot of reduced to the model, um, you know, so one of the goal of the reduced to the model is uh, getting uh, good, accurate you know, solutions. But at the same time, you would like to accelerate and get some speed up uh, compared to the corresponding high fidelity models we have. So I haven't seen any speed up uh, results from your presentation. So uh, if you can comment on some of them. Uh, Stephen, I, I cannot hear you. Um, I'm sorry, I muted you. myself and then I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, a lot of what I'm showing here fits very much into the framework of reduced order modeling that people use with a projection based methods, Galerkin projection. Um, you know, they have these known speed ups over, uh, over full. And, and so, I'm not supposed to talking about the speed up factors. But I would argue that our methods are actually um, better in terms of speed up than Galerkin projection. Because if I take an n-dimensional PDE discretization and I project it onto R mode, let's say R is 100, my quadratic nonlinearity is going to end up looking like an R by R by R tensor, so R cubed. Okay. 
And so very quickly, even for moderate reduced order uh, dimensions, our reduced order models can become as expensive as the original full order model. But our models are not dense like those reduced order Galerkin projection models. And in Galerkin projection, every single term that could be there is there. Whereas our sparse procedure kills as many terms as possible. So our scaling, the number of terms that we get is much closer to R log R, which is much, much better than R cubed. So again, none of this is rigorous, but in principle, these are extremely, extremely fast. Fast enough, in, for, for instance, that you could use them for real-time model predictive control um, in some examples. Very nice, very nice. Thank you for the answer, uh, Steve. We have a bunch of questions, but uh, Train, you raise your hand, so. I, um, I did. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Hey, Steve, nice talk, very nice talk, as usual. I have a, I have a quick question for you. So, um, I mean, is there, so you, you, you mentioned this projection with you sort of the models, um, and, and since they, they're derived from, you know, like PDEs with, uh, with classical tools like Galerkin projection. So, so many times it's easy to, it's straightforward to prove, uh, to prove, uh, you know, things like uh, convergence, like, uh, stability for the, for the, uh, you know, uh, for these videos or the models, projection based, for example. So can you do the same for for the for the models that you're uh, you, you know that seen this bits out? So I understand that you know you and the JC uh, came up with this idea of uh, constraining, and I think that this you know uh, adds some mathematical uh, support to 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 these models. But other than that, is there anything else that that you can you can prove? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, uh, and I think you're you're 100 correct. Like this is one of the strengths. Uh, traditional approaches is that there is this wealth of tools um, you know, that have been really hard fought to build these, these convergence guarantees and uh, stability guarantees for Galerkin projection models for projection models. Um, and I'm actually very, very excited about this. Um, so Alan Cap I mean, Alan is just an uh, incredible researcher, and he's working on one of the hardest problems in my lab, this, this MHD fusion equation. Mm -hmm. We have lots, lots of terms in the model, high dimensional state vectors, so he's really challenging himself with a lot of the complexity that Cindy sometimes struggles with. And so his models are not always state function, right? Oftentimes he'll cook up a model and it just blows up. It's really frustrating. Um, and so instead of getting frustrated, what Alan did was, this is very recent, um, it's not published yet, he's taken that global convergence result of uh, Jan Ost and uh, Barrett Nowak and has essentially built in those st global stability and convergence uh, conditions into this in the optimization procedure. So you can look at it two ways. One, any SIMI model, now we can analyze directly what its global, sorry, what its basis of attraction is using these conditions. Mm -hmm. And second of all, we can add as a constraint to our regression that we want our model, you know, stability in a, a certain epsilon ball around, you know, wherever our training data is. Still kind of wrapping our heads around how useful this is, how well it works, how much more expensive all you know, again, this is going to sort this out, but it really blew me away. I didn't think it was possible. And so um, if you had asked me a month ago, I would have told you something totally different. So that's how, how fast Alan's been working on this. Thanks for the great question. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Oh, and okay. I, actually, I'd love to get your opinion about, you know, the stuff too. I know we've got quite a few experts uh, here, you know, uh, trying among them. So this, this, we would certainly benefit from, uh, from a little bit of a sanity check here since this is not our, um, you know, our main mainline research. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. Dan, Dan Driver raised uh, the hand. Uh, why don't you uh, unmute yourself and speak up? Hi, uh, less of a question and, and maybe more of a request. It looks pretty incredible. And I think it would be really helpful for me if you hosted something like a hands-on workshop, maybe like a half a day that was like data to dynamics mm -hmm. with Cindy. Um, where we just learn how to turn the crank and 
and things like that, I think that would be really incredible. So, so less of a question and, and just a thumbs up maybe for, for a workshop. Thanks. That's a great suggestion. Um, you know, I'll put it out there in a very, very discreet sense, but I think you're right to bring it together in a workshop. And, um, so, for example, we have um, Brian De Silva led this Pi Cindy package. And so he has, you know, GitHub tutorials and YouTube tutorials through how to use the software at the bottom of the library. Christoph Lazo at the lectures. And he's a brilliant lecturer, and he, you know, has built this into his curriculum for his master's students. So he exactly how to kind of build these models. But I think you're right. Like it would be nice if we could provide an engaging kind of interactive community workshop type effort. Thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, thank you. I will definitely be pulling. I think I'll definitely be pulling the library out, and um, maybe if you could uh, send some of those resources to Young Su to distribute to this list. That would be really great. I'd love to watch those videos and we can pretend to be master's students for a day. Cool. Sounds good. Thank you. That sounds good. Okay, let's move on to the next. Uh, Brian, you raise your hands. Why don't you unmute yourself and speak up? Hi, it was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I just had a quick question. I was wondering, um, you didn't talk much about um, how many simulations uh, were needed to sort of generate the data you did this sort of uh, decomposition on. And I wanted to get a sense of how many you know, runs you would need to do since, since in my field at least, there's, you know, it's very expensive to run these folder models, so we're not, we wouldn't be able to run them, uh, uh, generate that that much data. So I just wanted to get a sense of that. Yeah, no, that, that's a fantastic question. Um, it totally depends. <laughs> so, you know, we've been surprised in both directions before, um, and I think you can still see my PowerPoint slide. So uh, when we look at this Lorenz equation, um, okay, so in the Lorenz equation, Kathleen Champion showed us something that absolutely blew us away. If I have data from a half of a period of this thing, it's basically going around one half of a load. If I have data with a fine enough delta T, you can identify the Lorentz model just from a half period, something on the switch. So sometimes it can be very, very smart if it's clean and fast. Um, and so there are these trade offs, again, noisy data or or less data or more data. There's kind of this cube of when it works and when it doesn't. For the fluid flow examples, um, if I remember, I gave the system two or three trajectories. This took me a couple of hours to generate on my laptop. And, you know, I had a trajectory that was, uh, it started at point C and wound up. I had one that started at point D and wound down and then wound up. And then I think I had another trajectory. I forget which one. And I had another trajectory that I used as a test one. It was not used for training. So again, for this, you know, relatively clean numerical data with a pretty fast DT, I actually need that much uh, data. Yeah, just two or three folder trajectories. Great. Thanks for the great question. Okay. Next, uh, Rob. Rob Blake, um, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, um, I had a question about systems with missing information. Um, for example, what would happen with your models if you fed in something like the Lorenz system but left out one of the coordinates, like Z? Um, how would your system fare recovering the information or rediscovering yeah. it in state? So that, that's a really, really, really good question. Um, and it turns out that this was an entire large research effort that we stumbled onto by asking that exact same question. So I don't know if you can still see my, am I still sharing my screen? Um, yes, yes, you are. Okay, I'm gonna share a different screen. Okay, can you see this keynote now, a different one? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so we got a fantastic referee comment in our original Cindy paper that asked that exact question. What if I don't measure all of my variables? I don't measure X, Y, and Z. I just measure X, okay? And so essentially what we do is we take that, that uh, unresolved data measurement or that, that, that single measurement, and we build a Hankel matrix. So we augment where our, our vector with time delays. We compute the SVD of that matrix, so we get these kind of angular coordinates. And it turns out that this is very closely related to the Koopman operator. 
these time delay coordinates give you an embedding of the Koopman operator. And so when you try to build a linear model on those time delay coordinates, the linear model you get is linear, which is crazy. So we use Cindy and any of the nonlinear terms. It's just a sparse linear model in delay coordinates. And this linear model is used for very nasty chaotic systems that switch with the And I don't have time to give you the full story, but long story short is that um, that question was very fortuitous for us and helped us stumble upon this idea that time delay coordinates actually give you a universal Koopman embedding. So, like, it opened up a whole can of worms, but very interesting stuff. Thanks for the great question. Okay. Um, I don't see anyone raising their hands, but we have a handful of questions in chat room. So, let's start with uh, Jeff Pino. Um, is there a requirement that the dynamic systems be elliptical or can hyperbolic systems also be modeled by wrong? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so definitely reduced order modeling methods for broad ranges of, of different classes of PDEs. So there's, um, there's reduced order models, there's reduced basis methods, there are, you know, you name it, there's different classes of methods for these different classes. And I think in principle, almost all be generalized with these kind of modern regression ideas. So for example, what I've shown you here is Cindy for time varying systems. We also have a Cindy boundary value problem. So uh, even if you have boundary value problems, you know, or like a, things, we can build nonlinear models for those structures. So that's a little bit of a tangential answer, but I would say it's a bit broader than you to say. Okay, next question is from Ik Zhang. Um, he asked, can you please explain more details about the results of complex high Reynolds number problems in your last slide? I'm asking this because I have experienced many other data-driven attempts for reduced total modeling before machine learning. However, although many of them worked almost perfectly, for simple problems such as Lorentz attractor and von Karman vortex shedding behind a cylinder. None of them were successful for complex turbulence problems. Thus, it is really great to hear that your method worked for bifurcating problems, turbulence, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I was blown away when this worked. Like, you know, again, if you asked me a year ago uh, what effects for real turbulence were, I'd say, you know, it's kind of, this works on laminar problems. It's good for flow control and reduced order modeling, but I, I would be skeptical. Um, and actually, it's not just our team. Um, several researchers from across the world have come up with different Cindy perspectives for closure modeling. So there's a great paper out of Michigan uh, and, and others um, in Germany doing this. Our perspective is really based on this idea. I'm going to jump around my slides a little so please we get vertigo. Um, it really boils down to this picture here. You know, this will not work for full, full unstructured turbulence, isotropic box turbulence. I don't think that's going to work. It's going to work when you have uh, these dominant patterns, these kind of low dimensional coherence and perturbed by turbulence. And that's, both, that's what we believe we have in these experimental systems. So, for example, um, I'm trying to find my backup slide here. Um, this is an experiment of a D-shaped body with our collaborators in Germany, in Braunschweig. And you can see that, you know, you get this kind of, you still get vortex force by turbulence, force by stochastic noise. These kinds of systems have now, because I think it's very hard for projection-based realms to capture this turbulence, because it's very rigid and constrained. Whereas when you regress, you have a little bit more degrees of freedom. It's a little bit wigglier. So your coefficients can move a little to be more accommodating to the data and to things that you're leaving out of the data. Um, again, we're still, you know, writing this up. We're still trying to figure this out. So I can't give you a perfectly satisfying answer, but um, we were surprised too and very pleasantly surprised. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Question by Jeffrey. Uh, given that you can capture the aggregate dynamics of the Lorentz system, can you say anything about extending the time window of predictability for systems with strong dependence of initial conditions? 
for example, weather? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'll point out that in the Lorentz system, we're learning the Lorentz system. Like, we're basically learning the Lorentz system almost perfectly, almost to machine precision coefficient of the Lorentz system, which means that our model has exactly the same sensitive dependence as the Lorentz model. We have the same chaos, we have the same exponential divergence of trajectory. And so the forecasting problem doesn't actually get much better. Um, it's, you know, how do I want to say it? At least we have the model that is actually what is governing the stretching and folding of trajectories. So that's good. We can use that for better data assimilation and better for uncertainty. But we still have these fundamental limitations. Um, and every system is going to have that. If someone tells you that they can beat, uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to like really interesting results on these um, uh, reservoir uh, reservoir networks and reservoir learning for for forecasting chaos. And I think you know the popular media has misconstrued. The authors have said very carefully. The authors said the right thing very carefully. <laughs> Um, quantifying how their error grows in these prediction windows. If you look at this cube of initial conditions in red here, you'll see that it actually stays coherent. It is not doing exponential stretching until it gets close to the saddle point at the bottom. So it's still not even stretching that much. And now when it gets to the saddle point at the bottom, that's when the exponential stretching occurs and gets out of control. So in chaos, it's not like you always have exponential stress. <laughs> there are phase space that massively increase uh, the local we have in the stretching. And so the results of machine learning model predicting the future of the system, all of them, everything, including the true Lorentz model, is going to begin to fail eventually when your trajectories go through those saddle points. Like that's just that's the nature of those equations. They're their exact or approximately. Yeah, it's a really cool question, a really cool research area. Um, and I think work by uh, uh, and others on the reservoir computing is super interesting. Okay, um, it's, uh, thank you so much, Steve, uh, for answering the questions. We have one last question, uh, but it's, by the way, it's past four after one o'clock. Um, are, are you still available, Steve? Uh, yeah, I can go for a couple more minutes, sure. Uh, okay, awesome. Okay, this is the last question I see from um, Cairo Armand. Okay, these examples show derivation of complete models from data. Has, um, have you looked at taking traditional models and attempting to back out missing physics? For example, looking at the vans based CFD code and giving it to the uh, fidelity of LES or DNS by reduced more order models correctors implicit in the simpler form formulation? Yes, yeah, so I love this question. It's an incredibly good um, So I will say that our colleagues have absolutely been using this for closure modeling, for modeling missing uh, terms, and, you know, for LES and for RAND modeling. Um, so yes, definitely. Not us per se, but our colleagues. We have to model missing physics in uh, plasma dynamics. So if you have uh, very, very highly resolved kind of, um, you know, particle and cell method simulations. They're, the magnetohydrodynamics, the MHD equations, are only approximate those full dynamics, and there are missing terms that we're trying to recover uh, with our collaborators at Slack. And I'll just find this last slide here. Uh, we have a pretty big effort uh, working with Boeing and others on what we call discrepancy modeling, where we have an imperfect model, something like a Hamiltonian model. And we're focusing our modeling effort on this discrepancy term, the model mismatch. And so what we see here on the top is it's not really a bad model. It's just our imperfect model. On the bottom, this is when we correct for that model mismatch and focus our modeling efforts on, on that discrepancy term. And it's a good enough model for stabilizing the inverted pendulum. Good question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I think that's all the questions I have been. I mean, do, do you do you get any questions uh, directly to you? Uh, people can. I believe um, these are the ones that I've seen as well. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, 
Okay, let's thank the, our speakers uh, today for the wonderful talk. Um, well, as usual, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, um, everyone. I really appreciate it. And it was very uh, informative and um, straightforward, uh, easy to follow uh, talk. Uh, we, I, I think we all got a lot of something from, from Steve. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and also, thank you so much for participating, uh, even though we passed the, the, our due time, which is one o'clock, seven minutes after one o'clock. And uh, this shows how enthusiastic we are um, about the data-driven data physical simulation. So uh, we will continue our seminar. Um, I believe that our next seminar is Wednesday next week. Um, so please stay tuned um, and stay healthy, of course. And let's go on. Okay, awesome. thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.